another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, in which today it is post-Adepticon, so we're chatting about the results of Adepticon. With the winner of Adepticon, Leander! Yeah! Leander's part of the Woodley Warriors podcast, the family of the Northeast that's been cruising around, crushing people ever since the beginning of this edition. Shameless plug. Shameless plugs are great. We love shameless plugs out here. Oh, yeah. And we're going to link it in the podcast episode description and everything. So, listeners, take a peek. And both of you actually did pretty well at Adepticon at your respective areas. Obviously, Adepticon won. Uh, Leander won the big Adepticon tournament. But, Jason, you did pretty well on the side, right? Yes, there was the pods thing, and I went undefeated in the pods. But um, there's a couple extra people, so there was two undefeated in my pod, and the other person got, like, a couple extra points above me, so I got second place. And then uh, I also did the the doubles thing. That was very interesting. I mean, it was fun. It was great. And uh, we got first place. Oh, nice. First place with a pair of elf players, right? Yes. Yep. I was playing Hand of the Archon, and... My teammate Alex was playing uh, Harlequin's Void Dancer Troop. Yeah, just a whole host of people ignoring rules, rampaging around doubles. That's true. Someone was like, you can't jump over that. And then we're like, you can't tell me what to do. So yeah, so Adepticon was great. How was the overall event? I've never been, so. And I think we had a podcast a couple weeks ago talking about the difficulties of signing up for Adepticon. But how were your experiences playing in the actual tournament? Um, I thought it was very well run. Uh, the The terrain across all the boards was was the same for everyone. So so you couldn't be like amazing on Chalnath and then be lucky enough to to get a Chalnath board. So it kept point scoring consistent. Did you? Was it the same for pods and doubles, Jason? Um, yeah. So the so actually. The way they did the pods was my favorite thing ever, where there was a whole strip of identical tables and that you would play on for one of the rounds, and then you would rotate over to another strip that was also identical, and um, there was four strips of tables, and there was supposed to be four pods, but like 13 players dropped, so then they just boiled it down to three pods. And, uh, but just, yeah, I mean, like, it it was really well done. I mean, obviously, GW... uh, so GW ran it. For, I guess that's not obvious. And but since they did run it, they they had you know lots of access to terrain, which is another thing that's that's great because um, terrain can be kind of an obstacle for some other people that run events, but not GW. So that was sweet. It was cool. Everyone was cool and friendly, and uh, yeah, I was very very impressed with how Adepticon did kill team. How's the sportsmanship at the more competitive tables, Leander? Um, it was, it was you know everyone just uh, knew knew the rules really well. There was no oh, I think at the top tables there was very little TO calling over. Just in the um, in the last game I played for for the golden ticket, there was uh, there was a lot of can he do this? Can he see this? So like the normal, just like having a third party arbitrator, which is a really, really big point about going to bigger tournaments is that if you get stuck on a rule, you can ask a TO for help compared to at home games. How did the older players compared to your experiences playing at home with your younger brother? Um, well, when I'm playing at home with my younger brother, we, we play like, you know, very always play by intent like there were take backs we like talk out what's the best move so the tour tournaments are always a very different experience from that and i think my um i i adjust pretty well to like that um that tournament environment but i think liam liam struggles a bit like if a few of his games i think he just was in the mindset like it's it's a home game and there were take backs when there there weren't. Yeah, definitely at tournaments there's far fewer take backs. You have to be much better about asking your opponent. And if your opponent says no, you have to kind of that is what it is. It's your opponent's right, not your right to get a take back in the middle of a tournament game. Mm-hmm. 
Or I suppose in like games like ours, you know, I can just watch dice go for three rounds and do nothing. <laughs> way, way back. Uh-huh. So you won with Star Striders, and they just ate a big nerf with the most recent balanced data slate, right? Yeah, I mean it it hurts and I'm I'm jumping ship. Oh wow. Got one nerf and jumping off the rogue traders, huh? <laughs> yeah. I mean the, the losing losing the relentless on the rotor cannon, like it just the the gun's just terrible now. Any um did any of the big cannon changes, would they have changed any of your games if you had hit on uh, fours instead of threes? Um, actually, there was only one, I think there was only one role in the whole tournament where my blast assets uh, actually worked. So I, I don't think it would have changed very much. I, I rolled an impressive amount of ones and twos with my blasts, so... Nice. So the the nerfs didn't even matter for you, <laughs> except for the rotor cannon. The rotor cannon that one hurts. Going from so for anyone who doesn't know, the rotor cannon was is six attacks on threes or six attacks on fours, three four um, with no no special abilities, or I guess it has fusillade, which nobody ever uses, and it was relentless to sync up with the breachers version of the rotor cannon, but it has moved moved back down to no relentless. It sucks. Yeah. And then the Undaunted Explorer's nerf. Like, I can, the their damage reduction strat ploy, I can understand why they did it. Uh, but, but, like, at the same time, now you're just playing 10 guys, like, 8 or 9 wounds, versus before it was 10 guys, like, 11-ish wounds, which, which was probably too good. Yeah. Yeah, I think the Undaunted Explorers probably will hurt less than it less or hurts less than the other two nerfs. Those ones are pretty big, but mm -hmm. the blast weapons didn't need to hit on threes because they were helping the horde matchups versus their elite matchup, which is where they struggle the most. Did you have that same issue at a in a mixed tournament? Because I know at the Kill Team Open, I had a lot of issues with the Space Marine players on In the Dark, but I figure on Open it should be a little bit better. Did you have that experience? Yeah. Yeah, I um on open I was I actually didn't play any Space Marines on Into the Dark. I played against Intercession and like he just he deployed all engaged and I was like, Oh, this this matchup sucks for me. He just rolled forward and like went out super hard on objectives and he didn't I didn't have the firepower to kill him quickly enough. Uh and what actually won me the game was a really lucky dice roll at the end where his um his bolter with like lethal five and p1 and uh a free reroll shot into my medic who wasn't who didn't have cover and then he needed to kill my medic and he didn't kill my medic and then i just won the game i see how about you jason did you have any um big moments big dice plays or were the Power of Elves just able to crush your opponents with uh, ignoring all the rules. You know, the Power of Elves were mm -hmm. uh, pretty overwhelming. I think my, my toughest game at all of Adepticon actually was a mirror into another Hand of the Archon player. And uh, that one was just like everything was perfectly even. And then we, then I decided, I was like, it's time to push and take a risk. And I did, and then the dice were just like, yeah, dog, you made the right choice. And I was like, hmm, that was lucky. And uh, what, what, was I, the, what, what was the play with? It, um, so I think I needed like one more point for pay the soul debt. And like the only like eligible looking kill that would be easy was going to be um, like one random piece that he had hiding around a corner and that I was going to go after with my arch sybarite and the, the blast pistol. Um, but like I was going to go for the kill on turn four and they were super far away. So on turn three, I like run out into the open and then he had, um, just a basic warrior with all the, the poison weapon upgrades run out and, uh, shoot, or maybe it was the, the sky splinter assassin. I don't know. But, um, I made just enough feel no pains to get away with one wound, won the initiative, ran over there and then killed the model. 
Um, but like the dice roll was a train wreck, but I had four command points. So I was just like, I'm going to reroll everything with all my command points. And then like that got the kill. Spicy. So it was really just like <laughs> very easily could have not gone that way. So is that a niche tactic or is that really just a, a Hail Mary? That was really just like a Hail Mary. Um, but some of the, uh, some of the, the cool plays and stuff, I mean, like the Dark Lance isn't trash in my opinion. Um, you just plan to use it on turn three. So like turn one, it just kind of, you know, loots a point or runs over and does whatever. And then turn two, at the end of turn two, you position it for a shot and then turn three, you go off. So did you have any, uh, kind of like new tactics over Adepticon that you were able to use, or did you find out any during the tournament that you ended up using multiple times? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, like, the main thing that I found out from Adepticon and, and really, like, decided on the car drive up was um, don't shoot ever, basically, unless it's a special weapon. And then otherwise, I was like, I'm not going to bother with a grenade. I'm not going to bother with upgrading the weapons of, the of like, the shooting attack weapons. And just, like, with the Hand of the Archon, you really just want to set up for a big turn of just kill everybody all in the same turn and that's probably turn three and it's basically just you know you you use all of the the buff ploys so you've got from darkness death and blade artists and then all of your people have four attacks and lethal five and then you just like boost around the corner and like if you roll any dice you're just gonna get triple crits like almost no matter what and uh people don't like getting triple crits Leander, can you confirm? Do you enjoy getting triple crit? <laughs> I I don't like getting triple critted. <laughs> Did you actually play against uh, Hand of the Archon at all during the, the main tournament? Uh no, I I didn't see them at all. Nice. <clears throat> Did you have any kind of like uh, new tactics or things that you did during um, your run at Adepticon that you found particularly good that you kept using, or like what was the what was your niche? that you found that helped you uh, during your run at Adepticon? Uh, something I learned to do with Star Striders on Into the Dark is just place a barricade like over, over the center of the objective. or So you can have a Star Strider concealed and safe uh, within two inches of anyone touching that objective marker. And so what I would do on objectives turn one I would pick an objective that I would take, like on uh, on the center line, and then one that I would just deny from my opponent. And uh, a concealed voidsman would just move and dash conceal to the center of it. And if my opponent wanted to wanted to like move on to the objective to contest it, I would just support asset them. And if they wanted to charge and fight me they would be on engage and I would support asset them. So the laser beam, you were, you, it sounds like you were using the laser beam aggressively. Yeah. Yeah. And like using it in like a fork. So there's no way to avoid it. I like that. Um, did you have it? Did either of you have any opponents that did um, kind of like a new surprising thing that you guys um, found good that you wanted to share with the listeners? Um, I actually played against Eddie, Eddie and Stu from the Warhammer studio um mm -hmm. me and alex in the doubles and i don't know why i've never thought of this or seen anyone do it but using the orc commando ploy so that everyone gets a dash if they're either on conceal or not visible and then using that to have the bomb squig get a, a little extra dash leander your brother plays uh commandos has he ever done that uh yeah i think it's it's once commandos player commandos players reach a certain uh skill level and they get really good at commandos they start a lot of the times they stop using that dash in the um in the first turn and then use it later in the game to just get like an insane amount of board control like my brother has used it in the past like at the end of uh turn one when he out activated someone he just um I think this was what he did. He had like a guy out in the open and then and so the person he was playing against took the initiative uh when they shouldn't have to try to shoot at his rocket boy out in the open. Uh and then he just did shh and dashed him to safety. 
Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, the Commandos actually ate, uh, got one of the bigger buffs of the more recent Palance patch notes, right? Because now you get the Commando Grout and the Bomb Squig at all times. So mm -hmm. that should be interesting. Is your brother excited about that? Uh, he was just disappointed in it because it doesn't... They're, they were already quite good into teams that aren't intercession, and this doesn't really do much to help against the intercession matchup. Oh, interesting. I would have thought that the bomb squig at least is one piece that can actually go in and kind of hurt an intercessor where before you had to pay for it and it also gives you the extra activation right so yeah it does but i think <laughs> on you would only take the bomb squig against uh intercessors or legionaries on into the dark and then you what my brother told me is then you're already taking the bomb squig against them. The grot helps a bit, but you still don't have the firepower to kill them, so they can just take double parry and roll forward. And because you only have four attacks, like if you charge an intercessor, you do like four damage with a commando, and then you die, and they just beat you. Yeah, you've somehow got to outshoot the intercessors as the commandos before. Before turn three <laughs> is what uh -huh. I'm saying in that matchup. Yeah, it's right. yeah. yeah, I think it's kind of just like run away from them. And uh, like the Grot has super conceal, which is nice. So he can run off and grab something. Like if, if there's one objective that's like totally out in the open, you can just put a barricade there. And then like they can't shoot him from a vantage point or anything like that, which is how I would use the, the Grot in the intercession. And then the Bomb Squig, I would still take him on an open board, especially for like the way that Adepticon was doing the terrain where you had like one of those little L-shaped Octarius buildings with a door and then you just put it up against the door and then you just have this huge threat range especially if you give it the extra APL and then you can just like missile out and nuke somebody and then since it's a big explosion that's already coming off of a base it's a really big explosion so like people are not going to be expecting that you're, they're going to be caught in a blast and then you can catch two intercessors with them anyways so that's kind of what I'd be thinking about with that. Uh, commandos are pretty cool. I've spent a lot of time thinking about them. I think second place at Adepticon was the Wormblade player. Is that yeah, right? Wormblade. So did, you played against him twice. Were there was there anything that he was doing as a Wormblade player that you haven't seen other Wormblade players do? Because mm -hmm. I think community wide, most of us are relatively lower on Wormblade, but he's still sporting them, and he got second place at Adepticon, which is a pretty big. W as far as Wormblade is concerned. So you played him twice. Was there anything that he was doing better than other people? Well, this I think he's the only Wormblade player I've ever played. So ah, all right, yeah. So nothing, nothing that you can tell. Which uh, uh, which agents did he take in both of your games? He always took the Keller Morph and the Lotus, which seems to make sense. Interesting. So the two highest impact pieces. Uh huh. Was the Locust able to do work in both your games? The Locust actually... Yeah, he didn't... I don't think he ever got a charge, like, fight, charge, kill, uh, because I just spaced my guys out enough to prevent that. But he was, like, a huge suppression piece. Like, if I wanted to go near something that he was controlling, his Locust would just, like, do his interrupt charge. Uh, so the interrupt charge, you have to spend the action point on during his turn. So he did that correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. It's definitely one of those weirdly worded abilities where if you don't cast it on your turn, it doesn't actually do anything. So <laughs> unlike dogs, like uh, you know the what is it? What's the can the canid and the crute hounds, which get three interrupts as long as they're on engage. So. And it's like a full range charge too. I did, I hadn't realized that. Yeah, just uh, you never want to get near him. <laughs> <clears throat> but then when you roll when you roll in melee with the dogs and you get no crits it's just it's so disappointing and then the dog just dies yeah having six wounds means that the star strider dog is never really doing that much in melee it's just kind of there to finish people off mm -hmm. um, and to go gain get you your two points mm -hmm. <laughs> surprisingly enough post balance data slate we did not have a retrieve item get nerfed i was you know or recover item or whatever it's called now but that was that was surprising. I really think it's just the best hack up in the game. Oh yeah, it's easily the best hack up. Not everyone gets 
a free model that can go pick it up. Like the teams with dogs and drones get even more benefit out of it than the other teams just because they have uh, faster movement, but it is definitely very strong. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, Travis, you were saying earlier you were thinking about taking crude, so you could take like recover item, like, uh, and then some other tack op that you can easily max, and then the faction tack op, where if you max tack ops, you get the faction tack op and just get an easy six every game. Yep, that is definitely how I play them. I have a bunch of written pre-written strategies that are all around maxing out your tack ops as fast as possible, and they change based on the, the maps. But yeah, it's definitely something that is good. Yeah, that's definitely the best way to plan for games. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out one of my favorite interactions against retrieve item, which is with Phobos. And um, so when you see someone is going to take that, it's very like you know, it's so common and so easy that you know they're going to take it. Um, you so I bring four reavers pretty frequently when I play Phobos and then usually the opponent is like oh I'm gonna give you the initiative because I want to out activate you and then they don't fully realize that reavers can use terror tactics so then my first activation of the game is just to park a reaver using terror tactics on that token and now it costs an extra AP to pick it up and you count as one lower for contesting things and then, uh, yeah, so, like, you, all you do is just park one Reaver there, and then, like, you completely deny it, and I've had people score zero on it just because of that. I think against Star Striders specifically, though, against, like, most teams with Recover Item, that would work, but Star Striders can then just move and dash a concealed guy, like, close to your Reaver, and then just laser beam you. Yeah, it it wouldn't work that great against Star Striders, but against everyone else, it's it is a pretty potent way to mess with people, especially if people have never thought about like someone running up and counterplaying the recover item, which I know a lot of players aren't expecting a lot of counterplay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So as far as the upcoming tournament circuit in the East Coast, you know, we've just finished Adepticon. We've got Atlantic City Open coming up. We've got a Maybe a couple more throughout the end of the year between Nova and the New York Open. Are there any? Is there anything else that you're planning to run this uh, in the next couple months, Jason? So our whole world over here got scrambled with the the store that we've been doing everything at. Um, started a new policy that kind of chased the whole club away. So now oh, no. we're sort of like spreading out and decentralizing and rebuilding. Um, and then I put together a little like packet that I would be looking for for running tournaments and i think i'm gonna like shop it around for a little while and see if i can find a store that'll be like yeah we can run tournaments on these terms leander are you looking forward to any other large tournaments i know that your family is coming out for the april 22nd new jersey community day that's coming up soon uh yeah i think so and then nova i'll be going to um new york op aco uh probably not just because of the amount of the amount of effort it would take for me to get there uh and then nyo i doubt i'll be going to that because i think it's like a week for uh the the kill team world champs uh and then my dad just doesn't want to drive like 12 hours a week before we're um flying out it's two weeks before it'll be november 4th 5th Oh, and two the weeks. finals okay. are the finals are two weeks afterwards. So, yeah, it, mm. we we positioned it around the world the world championships. So, but yeah, November fourth, fifth, we're getting the date locked down. We're getting the location locked down. Um, Atlantic City Open for anyone who's interested is I think June sixteenth to eighteenth, and tickets are open for that. Um, hopefully, we'll have another tournament in between Nova and ACO that we're going to be announcing, but it's not out yet. Anything else you wanted to call out, Leander? Um, I I don't think so. Thanks again for coming on to the podcast with us, Leander. It's been great having you. Yeah, thanks, Travis. Thanks, Jason. Yes, and thank you, listeners. Stay tuned.